Hi, how are you this morning? Or perhaps this afternoon, or perhaps even this evening. My name is Bill Meyer. I'm one of the physicians here at Carolina Conceptions. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we have been in practice here for about 10 years. And you're probably viewing this video today because you are a couple or a woman who has had recurrent miscarriages. And the way we define recurrent miscarriages is two or more spontaneous, spontaneous miscarriages in the first trimester. And that's how the American Society of Reproductive Medicine actually defines recurrent miscarriage. And one of the questions that is often posed by couples is, well, what's the chance that these miscarriages ha have actually occurred just by chance? And, you know, the first miscarriage in a young woman around 25, the chances of her having a uh, miscarriage by chance is about 11%. But once she's had two or more miscarriages, a miscarriage by chance is only about 1.2% or so. So somewhere between 1% and 2% after two miscarriages. Now, if a woman is older, 30 to 34, her chances of miscarriage um, by chance, the first one, is as high as 15%. But then again, it drops down considerably once she's had two miscarriages. And in those cases, the chances that the second or third miscarriages occurred by chance is more about 2%. So we can see that miscarriages occurring by chance do occur in an increased level as, or an increased rate as women age, um, but it's still fairly, fairly low. And after two miscarriages, the chance of another miscarriage occurring by chance is pretty small. So Miscarriage rates increase by increasing maternal age, and um, this is really based on um, looking at the chances that the chromosomes will be in will actually be abnormal in the egg. So, a woman who is under 35 years of age, the chances that she might have abnormal chromosomes in her egg is only about 10%. And then it increases every five years by about twofold. So a woman who is 40 years of age, the chances of she, her having abnormal chromosomes or aneuploidy in her eggs is actually about 30%. And women who are 45 years of age, the majority of their eggs are actually affected by aneuploidy. Now, since the eggs have more chromosomal abnormalities as women age, the chance of miscarriage also occurs in mother nature at an increased rate as women age. If a woman is 25 to 29 years of age, her chance of miscarriage is only about 10 to 15 percent, which is still pretty high. But as women age, and many of these women we see in our practice are who are 40 to 44 years of age, their chances, if they get pregnant, of a miscarriage are as high as 55 percent. So how do we evaluate couples who have recurrent miscarriages? Well, I think one of the things that first off we might consider in patients is a chromosomal analysis of hopefully future mother and future father, at least of the mother and her significant other. And that's a chromosomal analysis is obtained by blood work and uh, we're looking at what we call a karyotype in mom, future mom and future dad hopefully. Now some people would argue that this isn't necessary because really it only gives positive results and that's usually a translocation of the chromosome, part of one chromosome being on another one, in only about three to five percent of either uh, the, um, in this case, the uh, patient or her significant other. Other people would argue that the test isn't necessary because it may cost upwards of eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Well, here in North Carolina, most insurance companies will actually um, cover a karyotype analysis because they realize that it's an integral part of the evaluation of recurrent miscarriages. Then the other thing that we look for is uh, we look for anatomical causes of miscarriage. Um, anatomical meaning something wrong with the uterus that might cause a miscarriage. Now the majority of problems that occur with the uterus are actually acquired so the woman's not born with it. She actually has this occur in her uterus as she grows older. 
the most common cause of a anatomical defect is actually a um, fibroid that occurs in uh, women. Fibroids either within the muscle of the uterus that actually push into the uterine cavity, or, which are called intramural slash submucosal fibroids, or actually fibroids which are benign growth, growths that actually occur within the cavity of the uterus, and those are called submucosal fibroids. Other things that may be associated with miscarriage are actually polyps and uh, um, scar tissue. Those can all contribute to um, miscarriage. Scar tissue can, or adhesions within the uterine cavity can occur usually from a previous procedure like a DNC, a hysteroscopy, an abdominal myomectomy, etc. Now women are also born with problems in their uterus that can contribute to miscarriages. Just like my nose and your nose is, is divided in two by a septum, um, your uterus can be divided in two by a septum, and you might not ever know um, because it doesn't cause any problems in sexual function. It doesn't cause any problems in menstrual um, irregularity. The uterus is just, has, that part of the uterus was not cavitated out. It was not absorbed when the mother was actually in utero in her mother. And the septated uterus, can not always cause miscarriage, but it frequently associated with first and even second trimester miscarriages. It can also cause preterm birth. Now, in the olden days, this needed to be, the septum needed to be removed by a somewhat major operation, but now we can do hysteroscopy where we actually look through the cervix into the, uter into the woman's uterine cavity and actually cut the uterine septum. We don't really remove it, we cut it, and it retracts within the uterine cavity. So the um, HSG or hysterosalpingogram, which is an x-ray where we, we inject contrast material or media into the uterine cavity, is probably one of the best tests to, de to determine whether a woman has these acquired problems like the fibroids, the polyps, the scar tissue, or one of the congenital problems like a septated uterus. So anatomical problems for, that can contribute to miscarriages is um, a fairly common event. In fact, it occurs in approximately 20% of um, women who have recurrent miscarriages. Now what about analyzing the products of conception? So a woman has a miscarriage, she passes the tissue and she wants to know should this be analyzed for chromosomes? Well, in the past, this was very difficult because a lot of times it, there was contamination with uh, maternal blood, maternal cells of the lining of the uterus, and often when the chromosomal analysis returns suggesting a female tissue, 46XX, it was hard to differentiate whether this was actually um, maternal uh, tissue or it was actually tissue that was consistent with the products of conception. With the new techniques, that has basically been, that problem has actually been ruled out. So many people feel that we should analyze the products of conception. Some people feel analyze it early, sometimes feel, um, analyze it after two miscarriages. The value of looking at chromosomal material may be that if the chromosomal material comes back chromosomally abnormal, then this would be a more common event that occurs in mother nature. It would be a more sporadic event and less often associated with recurrent miscarriages. Those couples who have recurrent miscarriages will often have their product's conception be of normal chromosomes. So that may be some value in looking at the products of conception chromosomally. Now what about the theories that suggest that a woman could actually be attacking her fetus um, or there's there's an incompatibility between she and or her and her fetus and these are autoimmune phenomena and alloimmune phenomena and it's suggested that women come in and they look for we do HLA typing on them we might even look for killer cells within their blood or even in their uterine cavity Unfortunately, really the controlled studies that have treated these patients, and the treatment can be fairly severe, it suggests that these women often get white blood cell transfusions or immunoglobulin um, injections or IV infusions. And these can, be, these can actually cause more problems 
than they set out to treat. So we and most reproductive endocrinologists don't feel that these causes of uh, recurrent miscarriage um, are actually real causes of miscarriage. Now there is another syndrome that's called uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And that's usually seen in women who have recurrent miscarriages and then have some laboratory evidence to support that that is they have antiphospholipid antibodies. And the three antibodies that the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and the American College of OBGYN suggest that we look for are the lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibody, and the beta-2 glycoprotein antibody. So we usually will run a panel on these um, when patients have recurrent miscarriages. If they come back positive, we usually repeat them six to eight weeks later to verify that they're actually true. And it's not that these antibodies have to be slightly positive. They have to be two to three times normal um, to be of concern and associated re with a recurrent miscarriage. How could these antiphospholipid antibodies actually cause recurrent miscarriage? Well, we used to think that they just set up a clot. These are clotting antibodies first seen in women and with lupus um, erythematosus. So women who had SLE or system, systemic lupus erythematosus had, an, had increased incidence of lupus antibodies, uh, lupus anticoagulant antibodies. And it was thought that they set up clots between the interface between their fetus and themselves. And this prevented the vascular perfusion of the fetus. And this resulted in miscarriage. So patients were treated successfully with heparin or other blood thinners. And it was thought that if you could prevent the clot formation, that hopefully women could have successful pregnancies. Well, we know now that the clotting or the coagulation theory is probably not the true reason that antiphospholipid antibodies cause recurrent miscarriage. Instead, these antibodies probably inhibit the release more so of HCG from the tissue that produces HCG, which are the trophoblasts of the, em of the embryo. So the antibodies can pre um, prevent that. They can also inhibit the trophoblast, which becomes the placenta, from actually spreading out along the uterine surface and actually propagating the pregnancy. So that and the other thing is, and probably the predominant reason that antiphospholipid antibodies are associated with a recurrent miscarriage is that they activate complement. And complement's an inflammatory condition. And in truth, complement will actually be suppressed by using anticoagulation, using heparin-like products. So part of our workup is actually the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now, the, there are a couple other um, proposed causes for recurrent miscarriage, one of them being infection, that the lining of the uterus or the womb of the woman is um, um, infected by mycoplasma or urea plasma. In fact, it used to be the lining of the uterus used to be biopsied and those uh, microbes were actually looked for. Now we just treat women often and their partners with two weeks of a tetracycline uh, antibiotic to eradicate putative or possible mycoplasma and ureaplasma. In fact, what we just say is it's easier just to treat people. This is the doxycycline that's used is often the same um, tetracycline that's used in two-week course of acne. So we treat both the patient and her partner. The other thing that has really become obsolete is the looking for a luteal phase defect. That is looking at the lining of the uterine tissue, looking for the glands, looking at the glands and the, and the tissue that surrounds the glands to see that they might be out of date. You know, the, when a woman's egg is fertilized and becomes a fertilized egg and embryo, it takes about six days for it to migrate to the uterine cavity and actually implant. So this implantation window is an area that many investigators look at. Well, we used to biopsy and take tissue from there and say, was the endometrial environment hospitable and did it date correctly for when the embryo could implant? Well, now we don't do biopsies anymore. And actually, we look at the menstrual history of a woman to, to determine whether she may have a luteal phase defect. 
So let's talk just briefly about the treatment options for um, women who have recurrent miscarriages who may have these problems. We talked about the septate uterus. It's diagnosed by a hysterosalpingogram. Well, that's usually an in and out or one day, usually takes less than an hour procedure where the septum is actually excised or incised and actually retracts within the uterus. If you have, a woman has chromosomal or her partner has chromosomal abnormalities, usually a translocation, then they can either use donor eggs or donor sperm, or more, more commonly today, PGS or pre-implantation genetic screening is actually used, where the embryo is actually biopsied after five days in culture, usually frozen at that point, and 4% or four out of 100 cells of the embryo are analyzed for the chromosomes. Surprisingly, in women and men who have uh, translocations causing recurrent miscarriages, only about 20% of their embryos will come back normal chromosomally. Those are the embryos that can be transferred in a future frozen thaw cycle for in vitro fertilization. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can be treated by a, um, uh, either heparin, usually we use Lovenox, and that's usually initiated um, once the patient is pregnant, and those pregnancies should, as it should all of these pregnancies be, at least initially followed by a high-risk doctor. As I talked to you about infectious causes, we treat patients with two weeks of an antibiotic, a luteal phase deficiency, which means that everything has come back normal, and we suspect that there may be some irregularities in the woman's cycle that may be contributing to her miscarriage. Well, in those cases, we would often treat them with gonadotropins or what we call follicle, sti follicle stimulating hormone injections. So the, we're trying to beef up the response of the ovary and along with that create a better environment for the embryo to actually implant into. So with the evaluation of genetic, anatomical, endocrine, autoimmune status, um, and sometimes even the evaluation of products of conception, the majority of couples, although it's not all couples by any means, we can often come up with a fairly substantial guess or reason for why they are having recurrent miscarriage. And this is much better than it was several years ago. So we encourage you here, the physicians here encourage you to you know, review this video maybe one more time, write down the questions you might have for your reproductive endocrinologist and talk to either he or she about the possibilities of doing certain diagnostic tests that may contribute to ascertaining why you are having recurrent miscarriages and hopefully they can implement therapy that will help you have a successful pregnancy and have a successful um, outcome and child. Thank you for uh, viewing our video today and uh, hopefully this will help you in your future endeavors.